hello there, and thanks for joining me as we go to Britain to explore a belief system that's gained recognition as a religion. It's modern pagan witchcraft, otherwise known as Wicca. Now, while you might think it's an ancient folk religion, Wicca was actually founded in the late 1930s by a middle-aged man called Gerald Gardner. This story of Wicca and its eccentric creator is presented by the very British historian and leading expert in pagan studies, Professor Ronald Hutton. You might not realise it, but in modern Britain you are never far from a witch. They don't wear pointy hats and they don't ride on broomsticks, but they do cast spells and they definitely believe in magic. And unless we're talking about Harry Potter, a lot of people find that problematic. Modern witches are often urban creatures, but as a reverence for nature lies at the heart of their faith, they conduct their rituals in parks and woods right in the heart of the city. But despite this, you would never know they were there. As an outsider, attending this ritual is a rare privilege. To talk me through it is one of Britain's highest ranking Wiccan priestesses, Christina Oakley Harrington. When doing a Wiccan ritual, one feels in connection with something very, very old and connected to the earth. And those things that we find deeply moving and beautiful, the moon, the sunsets, those parts of nature that we don't understand that give us a sense of mystery and awe. May this place be blessed and sanctified. We make a Wiccan ceremony by casting a circle, and that's done with a wand. What it's like to cast a circle is to make a space that is completely within nature in order that we can leave aside those things that we have to deal with every day. But this is a place of rest. So mote it be. So, so mote it, it be. be. There's a part of the ceremony in which we consecrate one another. And in that moment, we're doing the balancing act, which is remembering the divinity that dwells within. So when we consecrate each other with the salt and the water, we're remembering, ah, you know, you're a human being in front of me, but you two are divine. Blessed be. And all the tension of all the duties and all the things that we have to carry, I just feel it just draining away. Blessed be. Blessed be. Now, I thought that was a lovely ritual. There's clearly more going on here than just a bunch of people having a good time in a wood. There's something quite deep. But does it bring me any closer to understanding what Wicca actually is? Rituals like this, with their reverence for nature, feel like the continuation of a very ancient tradition. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth because Wicca doesn't have its origins in the mists of time, but in 1930s, Dorset. This old house in Hampshire has a remarkable claim to fame, for it was here on a night in 1939 that a middle-aged man called Gerald Gardner was apparently initiated into witchcraft. I was blindfolded clasped from behind and told, I give you the password. Gerald claims that he was stripped naked, brought into a room full of witches, all similarly nude, and then given the secrets of an ancient magical religion. I was then pushed through a doorway and into the circle. And then the word Wicca was mentioned. Wicca, witch, they're witches witches still exist. For clues about Gerald's journey to becoming Britain's most famous witch, we need to delve into his earlier life. Gerald Gardner came from a family that had made a fortune in the timber trade. He grew up in Lancashire, but at the age of six, he was packed off abroad with his nanny because of ill health, and he never went to school. Gerald Gardner was essentially an unwanted child, I think, really, because he was asthmatic and bronchitic and he was sent out to the Far East for his health. But the family never really reclaimed him. Gerald was more or less sort of left on his own. 
uh, to learn, and he did. Gerald became very well-travelled very quickly, and as a colonial, it was natural for him to seek his fortune among the tea and rubber plantations of the Far East. But while most colonials were content to sit back and drink g and Gerald went out and studied the tribal cultures of the places where he was living. In particular, he became fascinated by tribal ritual magic. One of the rituals that he attended was putting a, a, a young girl into, into trance. Disease was driven out of their bodies by spells. Magic to these tribal people was a matter-of-fact affair. It was real. Gardner's fascination with tribal magic went along with a deep interest in Western occultism. He was inspired by pioneers like Sherlock Holmes author Arthur Conan Doyle, who was heavily involved in spiritualism and had become one of the most prominent public figures in magic and the supernatural. Gerald picked up on Conan Doyle's magical world and it wasn't long before he was following in his footsteps, experimenting with seances and spiritualism. So by the time he retired to Highcliffe, Gerald had been studying magic for decades and he soon made contact with local occultists, in particular a large group of Freemasons who were based nearby. They were people who knew the local folklore, they knew the lie of the land. Those people, as he got to know, were interested in something else as well. This something else turned out to be a kind of native English version of the ritual magic Gerald had experienced in the Far East. It was real English witchcraft and Gerald wanted in. He began taking part in magical rituals out in the New Forest. But what did witches actually do? And at this point in British history, what did it mean to call yourself a witch? In Britain, there is a long history of useful witchcraft dating back to the Middle Ages. Known as the cunning folk, these witches would cast spells to heal the sick or bring good luck. Research has shown that Gerald essentially used these spells in his own New Forest rituals. But it was his ambition that set Gerald apart from the cunning folk of old. For him, these English folklore spells held much greater power. Gerald had ambitions to use magic on a much grander scale that would change not just your health, but the entire world. He was about to test his new-found magical powers against something truly dangerous. As just across the sea, Hitler began to threaten invasion. When he wasn't casting spells, Gerald was also a prominent member of the local Home Guard. And so, it made sense to Gerald to prepare to repel the Nazis, not just with rusty bayonets, but with magic. And on one night in 1940, that's exactly what he and his coven are said to have done. I've come to the depths of the New Forest in search of the exact location of this famous magical encounter. And here to talk me through it is Gerald's biographer, Philip Heselton. Yes, hello, Ronald. Glad you found it all right. We're here because Gerald Gardner said we were taken at night to a place in the forest and there we created the largest cone of power that we had ever attempted. What's a cone of power? Well, it's not a physical cone. It is something magical, something... a thought form, if you like. And the great cone of power was raised and slowly directed in the general direction of Hitler. They built up power dancing quickly round. And then when that power had reached its climax, there was this cone of power which could be seen by those who were sensitive to these things. The command was given. You cannot cross the sea. You cannot cross the sea. They rushed towards the fire, at the same time raising this cone of power and sending it over to the German high command and indeed to Hitler himself. Now, from the perspective of the present day, this story might seem utterly preposterous. 
which is effectively sacrificing their lives in order to create a spell to ward off the Nazis. But Hitler didn't come, and even the British government seemed to feel threatened by the power of magic. Shortly after Gerald's Cone of Power ritual, a spiritualist called Helen Duncan was actually prosecuted for her occult activities. Duncan had rattled twitchy naval officers and attracted the attention of the authorities in 1944, when she held seances in Portsmouth and began answering questions about people's relatives who had been killed in action. She had been too good at her uh, prophecies and uh, had uh, alarmed the, uh, the security forces. Uh, and in fact, she was imprisoned for uh, a while. But Gerald's passion for the occult was unwavering. And crucially, he wasn't alone. And these colorful characters gathered here at the Atlantis bookshop which had a temple in the basement and sold rare texts with instructions on how to summon the dead, talk to angels, and wield supernatural power. What sort of things happened at this shop and why do they matter to history? They matter because there were so few places that people who've been interested in this sort of thing could meet their fellows, where you could talk as equals. Where you, whether you were a witch or you were a high ceremonial magician or an astrologer or a numerologist, you have always been treated as equals here. What do you think of Gerald Gardner? My father used to come home and say, he was in again today, kids, king of the witches. His hair goes this way, his beard goes that way. And he had style, he had presence, and he had a great cracking wit as well. But Gerald was not content with a secretive underground subculture. He wanted to take Wicker to the masses. So that's exactly what he was about to do, with a bang. Dr. Gerald Rosso Gardner is a qualified scientist. He is also a witch. Most witches are initiated quite young. And of course, they're, they're, some of them are young, some of them are middle-aged, some of them are old. Just a few years previously, Gardner had been performing spells in the New Forest with a small coven of witches. So, how on earth did Gerald make the transition from local eccentric to celebrity on the BBC's flagship current affairs programme? Gerald had come back to London in the mid-1940s full of enthusiasm about Wicca, but he had to be careful. It might be OK to discuss this stuff in the safety of the Atlantis bookshop, but the Witchcraft Act was still in force. Britain was still a very orthodox society, and anything other than Christianity was treated with suspicion. But Gerald was desperate to spread the Wiccan word, and so in 1949 he found a compromise. He adopted a pseudonym and he published a novel, and this is it. High Magic's Aid. Although it had to be disguised as a work of fiction, it is actually the first published account of Wiccan magic. This passage, one of many, describes how to conduct a classic Wiccan ritual. Upon the altar lay the remaining pentacle, also cords, black cloth, and other things which he would want for the operation. Taking this pentacle, he bound it with a cord and shrouded it with a cloth. It could be seen just as a, as a story, but for those in the know, you know, it was, uh, it was quite revealing. It included quite a lot of witchcraft rituals that are, are, are fairly familiar today. In some ways, it's a terrible novel. It's too many yees and, and prithies and forsooths and thous. But in essence, it's witchcraft writ large there. Then in 1951, after a campaign by a group of spiritualist MPs supported by Winston Churchill, who himself had become interested in the occult, the Witchcraft Act was finally repealed. Gerald was now free to out himself as a witch and to tell the world all about Wicca, which was by now developing into a fully-fledged religious system. Since his New Forest initiation, Gerald had become something of a magpie, building his new religion from many sources. He borrowed heavily from both English folklore witchcraft and modern shamanic magic for his spells and rituals, 
whilst the iconic symbols that would become synonymous with Wicca, most notably the pentagram, were in fact ancient symbols that had been adopted by the Freemasons. This blend of influences found expression in Gerald's collection of magical objects. I've come here in pursuit of one of the most significant collections of Wiccan artefacts in the world. And among them is one of the most important Wiccan manuscripts of all. The owner is John Bellum Payne, a property developer now living in Spain. Please come in. Thank you. He is also one of Wicca's senior priests and, in the great tradition of the faith, has had many of Gerald's most prized magical possessions handed down to him. Wow. Can you talk me through some of Gerald's objects and explain what they were for? OK. This was Gerald Gardner's wand, or at least one of them. And he would have used that to cast a circle. The other items here that we have from Gerald is one of his athames. What is um, an athame? It's a ritual knife. We only use an athame for magical purposes. Oh, my. Obviously, uh, it's, it's phallic, so it would be used for some sort of uh, recreational purpose, I think. Other items of Gerald's are these two crowns. The priestess would wear this one, of the, uh, representing the triple aspects of the moon, and this would be what he would have worn, which was, a, which was representative of the horn god. So they're representing goddess and god in the circle. Goddess and god, absolutely right. Now I'm being granted a remarkable privilege. I'm about to see a Wiccan holy grail. So, Ronald, this is it. This is Gerald Gardner's first and original Book of Shadows. First of all, it's probably the most famous book that there is in, in the craft. And as far as that is concerned, my take on this book is I think it's as important as, as owning the original Bible, because it's, it's full of just everything that Gardner learned at that stage from a whole load of different sources. First, draw a circle with athame and sprinkle with exorcised water. Light candles. And this is the important part, is this is a book of experiences. This is a book about things that have gone right and some things that have gone wrong. This is wonderful. It's certainly the oldest Wiccan book surviving in Europe. It's, it's a strange mixture, which I think is classic of Gerald. Mm. It's a mixture of a book of actual ritual to be used in the temple and read from. It's also a kind of notebook with odds and ends taken from all sorts of sources. I call upon the goddess to enlighten the hearts of all whom I call into this circle. In the Book of Shadows, Gerald had written not just a guidebook to the spells and rituals of Wicca, he'd produce a manifesto for a new religion. Wicca had truly been born, and now he was desperate to take it to the masses. In 1954, Gerald published his essential guide to Wicca, Witchcraft Today. He also opened Britain's first museum of witchcraft on the Isle of Man, and he started to be featured in newspapers looking for a sensational story. Today, the people prints a report that discloses the existence of a repulsive and priestess go wild. It was after a series of muckraking tabloid features accusing Gerald of practicing black magic and devil worship that he really got his big break. Gerald was invited to defend himself on Panorama. This would become a definitive TV moment watched by millions that gave the British public their first sight of a real live witch. Is it true that the dancing takes place as a rule naked? Yes. Now, why is that? It's the tradition, it's the order, the order of the goddess, who, you shall always be naked at my right. And of course, to, to work magic, you must be naked. Gerald couldn't have hoped for a bigger audience. And even in the face of some provocative questioning, he kept his dignity, just. 
I want to put this to you very frankly. I've been reading your book and I'm tempted to ask you, is it not a fact that these meetings are really very largely sexual orgies? They're not. Not in the least. Gerald might have faced derision from the BBC, but 12 million people had just heard about Wicca for the first time. And what then happens when the circle is drawn? Well, then, of course, there's generally a starting with the dance, then there's a worship of the gods, then, of course, it depends what they want to do. If they want to work magic, they work magic. I think Gerald felt he was a nothing less than a sacred mission, and now he had found his audience. <laughs> And at the dawn of the new decade, there was something else in the air that would work in Wicca's favour, social revolution. As the 60s began to swing, Wicca's emphasis on gender equality, nature worship and sacred sexuality made a perfect fit for the historical moment. It was almost as if Gerald had predicted how the world was about to change. He was a conduit for something that it was the right time for that to happen. By the time that Gerald died in 1964, Wicca was on its way to becoming a global faith. And in America, where the counterculture was really rocking society to its core, Gerald's radical new religion exploded into a phenomenon. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Wicca continued its march into the mainstream, helped in no small part by hugely successful cult movies like The Wicker Man, which provided a tantalising, if inaccurate, glimpse of the pagan faith to cinema goers throughout the world. In Britain today, Gerald Gardner's radical religion, his feminist, eco-friendly, magical faith, has taken its place at the heart of our culture. Where once witches were persecuted and driven underground, today they can be out and proud. And as the faith has grown, Wiccans have formed campaign groups. These organisations lobby the government about the ongoing recognition of Wicca and its followers' rights. One of the most prominent and active of these groups is to be found in the modern police service. I want to find out how Gerald's legacy is influencing policy and changing attitudes within some of our most respected professions. Andrew Pardy is spokesman for the Police Pagan Association. Border officer Adam Pement represents pagans in the Home Office. The format we use, the way things are laid out, was brought to us by Gerald Gardner. And when we look at it, if I look at Wicca, it's probably the only religion that England has ever given to the world. Police officers may go in and they may see an altar set up and they may not know whether the possession of a ritual knife falls underneath defences in law or not. And it's simple things like that that just make the police a bit more reassured of how they're dealing with people, but also allows that pagan community to know that they're going to be dealt with fairly just as any other person would. And if Gerald's legacy is becoming influential in the UK, in America, his radical English faith has infiltrated the very heart of the establishment, the US military. Roberta Stewart and Reverend Selena Fox are on a mission. Stewart's husband, Sergeant Patrick Stewart, was killed in combat last September in Afghanistan. The Nevada native was a Bronze Star and Purple Heart recipient. He was also a member of the Wiccan religion, whose symbol is the pentacle. Stuart was refused a Wiccan memorial because the authorities viewed his faith as a cult and not as a true religion. I said, where's my husband's plaque? And they indicated that the emblem of our chosen faith was not allowed to be on there. Since this test case in 2007, the Wiccan pentagram has been a religious symbol officially recognised by the US military and can be carved on the gravestones of service men and women who are killed in the line of duty. Back in the UK, Wicca's evolution shows no sign of slowing down. And what's interesting to me is that it's the younger generation that is leading the march. This is Croydon, South London. Not perhaps the most magical place on the planet. This weekend, Croydon is hosting the biggest gathering of witches in the world. I've come to Witchfest. When Gerald Gardner wanted to find witchcraft, he had to do so by getting into a secret coven. Today's would-be witches can do so at the click of a mouse. But do these young people know who Gerald Gardner was? To me, Gerald is 
a trailblazer and a revolutionary. He was so brave and courageous in, in embracing a religion that was so outside of the norm. He inspires me because he, he was so alive in, in his own lifetime and vibrant in that. I appreciate how he helped make it more public and, you know, we're all interested in it probably because like, of his influence within the witchcraft world. Gardner's legacy clearly lives on amongst this new generation of witches. But have modern Wiccan beliefs stayed true to the original vision of its eccentric creator? What does paganism mean to you? To me, paganism is a, it's a spiritual path and it involves reverence for nature. Wicca means to me finding my spirituality embodied in a religion that is incorporating a feminine divine. What would you call it? Is it a religion to you? Is it a spirituality? Is it a craft? All three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. In the course of making this film, I've encountered many people who practice a religion called pagan witchcraft, which to them is clearly as beautiful, transcendental and effective as other faiths are to their believers. And it was brought into the world by a classic English eccentric who managed to publicize a religion of lasting power. It's feminist, it's nature-centered, it seems to give people a great deal of choice. But the single most powerful idea I take away from Wicca is this. Whereas other faiths say, this is what you should feel about the divine, this one says, this is how you can feel divine.